Welcome to today's episode of Financial Fluency. Today I am here with Sage Hobbs, who is the author of the new book, Naked Communication, Courage to Create the Relationships You Really Want. I'm sorry that I totally paused on that subtitle. I wanted to make sure I was getting it right, so I looked down to read. Was that right? Courageously create the relationships you really want, but pretty darn close. Idea. See, I wrote down courage, create. <laughs> so I was like, must be courage to create. Courageously create the relationships you really want. You are also a, um, you have a master's degree in counseling and psychology mm -hmm. and you are a coach, right? Correct. Yep. And a speaker. Let's just get everything in there. Coach, yeah. speaker, author, <laughs> Does that cover yeah, totally. That covers the professional realm, of course. Then there's mom and all the other things we all we all do in our lives. <laughs> okay, so just before we hit record, we were talking about your book, and then I suddenly was like, wait, 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 let's hit record because we should just talk about it so everyone can hear about it. Totally, great. I started the book and have not yet finished. I'm going to be completely transparent there. I've had two weeks of sick kids, one or the other, and I just didn't quite get my reading schedule on, even though I'm doing my 100 books a year on Goodreads, which everyone should go follow me, follow Sage on Goodreads. Let's all get our, our books in there. Um, so I'm going to let you take the lead on your book discussion. So let's talk about the book. What, what, what led to writing it? What inspired it? Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. So I've always wanted to write a book. I love to read. I'm really impressed with a hundred book challenge. However, like I'm trying to think about what would it take for me to read, to, to read two books a week. Um, but I've always, I just, what's that? Audible.com helps. I do one audio book and then one either Kindle or physical book. Oh, that, okay. Got it. That's a good yeah. strategy. Um, but I've always loved books and I really have always wanted to write one. And I, I didn't really even consider what that would look like until a few years ago. And then I was like, it's time. I really, I really want to write something that's there to be written. And I, once I made that commitment, something about me is once I make a commitment, <laughs> I figure out how to do it. I love like that kind of creative problem solving. Like how do you actually birth this idea? Right. Um, so I worked with somebody who had done it before and she was already my coach in a very, in, in a different capacity, but I was like, you've written books, let's figure this out. Mm -hmm. And then it was really this creative process, creative and structured both hundred percent. If you actually want to finish something, I believe you usually have to have a structure or container to finish it. And, um, I started thinking about all the different things I'd like to write about. And the truth about me is that the only thing I've ever found fascinating for any period of time is people since I was like a kid, you know, somebody just asked me again, well, what was the thing you loved to do that you could do for hours when you were a kid? Like if you were called inside, you went, you wanted to keep doing it, you know? And it was always, I want to play with my friends. I want to be on the phone as a teenager. I wanted to be with people, figuring them out, asking questions. I was just curious about people, Every, strangers. I would talk to strangers. I still talk to strangers. Um, and so I really started just looking at where does my, my passion and my curiosity around human behavior and human potential line up with what I am, what I do professionally. I have always done professionally. Um, so this is like an, the next iteration of my career is this coaching and author and speaking bit. And before that I was a counselor for a decade, um, primarily in public schools with teens and families. And so all of it has always been about people, right? And where my strength really lies is like how to help people connect better with each other and with themselves. And really, you know, I've had many people say to me, I wish you could just have that conversation for me. Or can I write down that script? You know, and I'm like, no, we want you to be able to have those kinds of conversations in your own words. But really that is what this book is about. It's around how do you peel back all the layers of conditioning and our automatic ways of being and our patterns of behavior to show up in a more naked way, real, which I consider to be clean clear, compassionate, and courageous. I don't, it actually ended up being those four C's. I wish I could say that that was super clever of me, but those are the ones that I kept repeating in, in the, in the book, which is just about how to be clean in your communication. So you're not bringing in all that like mean, nasty junk that you've been storing up or making, you know, creating, building evidence for or whatever. And how do you be clear, like actually asking for what you want, not just hinting and hoping, cause that's where the power lies. How do you be compassionate? And for me, that's so much of that is about directed at yourself, right? But really, you know, if you can be compassionate with yourself, you're, you'll be able to see how to be compassionate more easily with others. And then courage is like the crux of it, honestly, because the main reason people don't have the relationships they want and don't have the conversations they know they need to have is because it's freaking scary and it's messy and we don't know how to do it and we're not really taught and we don't want to look bad 
and we don't want people not to like us. And so that's where the courage piece comes in. So this book was written last summer. Um, the title is my husband's genius driving somewhere through the middle of a 5,000 mile road trip with my two small children in the middle of corn country, Midwest. And I could not come up with a title. I've been writing the book and I was like, what is this title? You know? And he, he came up with it. He's like, it has to be, um, I, I'm sort of edgy. I'm a straight shooter. I'm from Philly originally. Um, I swear. So I, I'll try not to hear, but you know, he's like, everything I kept saying was kind of like sterile. And he's like, it's about being naked. Like it's about, you know, really being raw. Um, and I was like, Oh, you're a genius. And he's a science teacher. So typically he's like, that's not his zone. I was like, Oh my gosh, how did you figure that out? <laughs> so that's where naked communication was born. That's great. I love that. And I, I think that's a really great description of it. And as you were talking about all of those things, I was thinking about like, not only are we not taught this, like mm -hmm. often um, the people that we have the most difficulty communicating with in that way, maybe the very people we learned how to communicate from, the people we learned our first words from, you know. Totally. Yeah. Genius. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah, we just had a bit of a family reunion, a Terrell family reunion here this past weekend. It was my father's 74th birthday. Oh, wow. And all five of my siblings came from all of our spread out places around. There are six of you? There are six of us. Wow. Yeah. You learned actually your communication from lots of people probably. Well, six of us across three different mothers though. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm we rarely have all been in the same place at the same time, sometimes for Christmases, sometimes for weddings, graduations or birthdays, but because we all lived with our moms, you know, um, after each subsequent divorce, like communicating us as siblings, communicating with each other is really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> all of us trying to communicate with our, our parents and our now spouses. And it's a very complex family. And I was just, I kind of was watching all of our dynamics being together because so much of our communication is not in person because we live in all different places. Right, of course. I was, about that. I was just thinking about this weekend and being like, it's so interesting. It is, it can be so hard just to say exactly what we mean sometimes when we're like, you don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. You don't want to offend anyone. You don't want to say something that sounds like it's against somebody else in some way, but right. Right. yeah, yeah. So. Families is where it's usually messiest. Our family of origin comes with like so much baggage, you know, and so many different messages, you know, just recently um, we had family in, in visiting and just listening to how siblings can interpret their childhoods differently. Like so much of it is just interpretation, but we see it as our own reality. Well, they, they had the same parents. They grew up in the same home. <laughs> And it was like, no, that's not how I remember it. Really? That's what you thought about that? My experience was this. And it was so, I mean, of course, I'm listening from my lens of like just deep fascination and how can we have people connect more and have more love on the planet and more personal power. And uh, there was no hard feelings. It was just, just a curious conversation around like, that's just not how I saw it. And each of them, there's no right or wrong. I and mean, I talk about that a lot in the book. There is Either, you know, you can either consider that um, everybody's right or nobody is in some ways. There are, certain, there are things that happen, you know, like mom and dad got divorced. That's something that happened. Another sibling was born. That happened. But mm -hmm. almost like aside from, you can get down into the facts if you really pay attention, but mostly we layer so much stuff on top of those facts yeah. and uh, we think it's real. Well, and with siblings too, you have facts that happen, but the different siblings will have been at different developmental stages. Oh, exactly. Um, you know, so there are things that happened in my family that I either I don't remember or were just so inconsequential to me as a, say, a three-year-old when my parents got divorced. For my sister, who was a seven-year-old, that was absolutely like foundation-shaking, earth-shattering moment. Whereas for me, I don't, I have very few memories of them being together. So it's yeah, hundred percent. Same in my family. I was thirteen when my parents mm -hmm. got divorced, and my brother was nine, and my sister was two. Yeah, and like she has no memory. She has no memory. And I was thirteen. I was I was pissed. Like the whole rug got pulled out from under me. It and shaped and informed my work today. It shaped and informed my marriage today. Um, and I was really like devastated. I was devastated. Like this isn't how it's supposed to go you guys aren't true to your word. I can't believe you anymore. Um, 
and it was actually one of my first lessons, you know, when I, when I've threaded together this work and this, the stories in the book, like one of the first lessons was that moment where they sat us down in the living room and said, we're getting separated. And I thought, what the F like, where did this go wrong? You, we take, you guys seem happy. You don't fight. We take them, you know what I mean? And it was the beginning of, you really have to nurture and pay attention to the relationships that matter to you if you want them to last. And that, if you don't, there's big fallout. Like lots of people are hurt and betrayed and confused. And so it was like one of my, my develop, I don't know that I saw it exactly like that at the time, but I can very much see now that that was one of the early kind of relationship lessons I got around what I really firmly believe that what people want more than anything else when they're dying is to have been connected to other people in their lives, to feel loved, you know, and to feel like they also had the chance to give love. It's really lonely, like to live in isolation. That's just not how we're built as human beings. We're, we're animals, we're creatures of community. Um, and so anyways, that divorce, yeah, exactly. Like we all have totally, the three of us are pretty spread out, same parents, but we have totally different memories of how that went down Com completely different in ways that that shaped us. And you may have been talked to about it separately and privately using different language and in different ways. To you as a 13 year old, they may have felt like that they needed to and could explain more to you than say your two year old or the nine year old. You know? Oh yeah. And I was like, I was like a 13 year old version of this. So I was like, what, what happened? You know, I was also like pushing for, um, I was pushing for answers. I wanted more information. So I got more information. Yeah. You know, that's interesting. So and when you talked about looking back at the end of people's life, what they wanted, um, have you read that Regrets of the Dying book? I've read segments of it. Yeah. And I watched an interview with her. And so, yeah. and I love one of the things she says is related. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's really not, you know, we, we think so much about the things we have to do to achieve and maintain careers and, and, right. problems and you know work focus and totally financial reward yet the one that's probably the most important of all that gets um overshadowed by all of those things is is family and having connections you know, particularly when children totally. turn, i think that's such a like the, the intersection of peak career moments for parents um you know often when you're in your mid-30s which a lot of us now are having our children in our mid-30s you know 30s to early 40s, say, like a lot of yeah. us are waiting until after we finish advanced degrees and have some time in the career field. And our husbands at the same time, it's their peak career time too. So if we take time out of the workforce, they feel even more pressure to stay in and earn more. Yeah. Um, or we're trying to juggle and not leave the workforce. And at the same time, we have these new young beings that we desperately want to bond with. But mm -hmm. it's almost like, yeah, it's, it's all of it coming at the same time. Like people who I are, know it's like, not biology. It's like not bio biologically lining up the way it used to, you know what I mean? Like yeah. when people had babies super early and, and we don't, one of the things she says in that book, like we don't value sometimes what we should value when they really, when she really interviewed all these people, women, women and men who were dying, like mm -hmm. we do, things pass us by and we forget to pay attention yeah. to, um, to people in our lives. Mm -hmm. And when I talk, you know, to me, it's not just our intimate relationships, although I believe it's great to start there, you know, are the people we share the most of our space with and our most of our time with, but there's so much joy and pleasure and fun in everyday connections. You know, I find that that enriches like my life, you know, so I'm at the post office the other day and there's the same postal guy often when I go and he's always so friendly, I think. And so I'm like, you're always in such a good mood. I super appreciate that. And he's like, really? I don't know. I don't know if I always am. I go, well, then I must put you in a good mood because every time I come here, you're in a great mood. And we have this little banter and he's just so happy to be seen and spoken to like a human being. And so later in the day, same day, pretty funny because I live in a city of about a hundred thousand people, small city. I'm riding bikes home with my kid on my, um, on, you know, my daughter's in a track what do you call it? A tag along attached to my bike and my son's on his own. And there's the postal guy walking down the bike path, you know? And he's like, Hey, I'm hey. And he gives me a high five. My kids are like, who is that guy? And I'm like, that's the post office man who was at the post office this morning. And I had a great conversation with him. And I want them to see that too, that like you can create relationships and community throughout your life and in different, they're not all your most intimate people, but there's a sense of being seen 
um, and human connection that I really feel like we're, we're longing for that, you know, and we're, we're really craving that. And it takes courage to speak up and just talk to people. Um, you know, the, the work is about communication, but behind that, it's regularly also about your voice, like reconnecting with your own voice and feeling like you have one. And, um, particularly women and girls, I think still struggle with that. I think we're still mostly taught to be quieter and to be more passive and to be more pleasing and to take care of others first. And so it does get, it gets messy, especially if you're like me or like you and you are somebody who has ambition and drive and wants to do good work in the world and wants to value our children and our time with them. And it, it can get that, that struggle is real in my experience. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. Um, I was just traveling back from San Diego recently, and I was observing some of the effects of automation in our lives with mm. older people. Um, and I had the, I actually started this little article. It was, uh, I think I was calling it ageism in the age of automation. And it was an elderly man at the kiosk trying to check in. He'd already checked in online. And he was, they made him go and check his luggage in. And he was like, all I have to do is drop my bag over there. I just need to take my bag. And they would not let him because he needed to print out the little thing. And it made you check in again. And it needed a lot of information. And he had to type things. And he couldn't see that well. And he was really frustrated. And he got really angry. And there's this huge line for me behind him. And I can feel the anger and annoyance of all yeah. the people behind him. And I was like, we just need a customer service person here. Like, this man does not want a kiosk to tell him what to do, or even the person standing, like the person standing near the kiosk should have just taken this man and yeah, one-on-one. -on -one. And it made me think about all the different ways now that people, maybe our age and younger, I'm starting to feel on the older side of a lot of technology myself now. Right, I know, I know. <laughs> I'll be 40 this year. Believe me, I'm like, oh yeah, that what? <laughs> yeah, I'm 41 and my kids are better at a lot of, even my kids have autism. So they're, but when it comes to screen devices, they are geniuses. Like they can, yeah. they make movies, they put music to them, they do all these things. And I'm just like, Amazing. how did you figure that out? But, um, but the boomer population and, and above, our parents basically a lot of them don't want that like not only are they not interested in learning how to do it they want a person yeah. they want to interact with somebody they don't just want to like use the atm or apm or whatever it is the post office they want to say hi to the post office person yeah they want a connection and once you're retired i think it's really different and i feel like so many ways in our lives now we're trying to use apps and use um systems and automations and things to like reduce all possible human interaction yes 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 totally don't want that so i would kind of love to see the backlash against it as and i well. think there will be so i always think there's a pendulum swing you know yeah. like with parenting it was like the parent is the authority and you listen to the parents in the 50s right and then those kids grew up and they're like i hated my parents they didn't understand me at all and so they went over here and they're like let's be best friends you know mm -hmm. what i mean and then they're like wait that doesn't work either. How do I have enough authority that my children understand that I, my job is to keep them safe, but that they also understand I can, you know, it's like, we're trying to find the middle balance. And our, your example is like, oh, it just like breaks my heart because the other thing in that situation is that somebody in line could have just stepped up and helped him and just showed him what to do. It would have been great if it had been with the airline, right? But we don't do, we have this like, sort of barrier between our human connection that I don't think was always there. You know, I think about my grandfather who's 93 and was a very proud, happy teacher for like, I swear he worked for 45 years or something until he made him retire. And he used to, you know, be able to tutor kids in math after school at his home. Uh, that would, my husband's a high school teacher, like that would never happen now. And I'm not saying that that has to go back to that, but just that level of interactivity on a personal scale, I think a lot of people are craving it. I see it in the online space, right? So I'm an author and a coach and a speaker, and, um, and I, you have to have an online platform. Like you have to be in, present in Facebook or an Insta or whatever, Goodreads, right? And um, there's so much incredible value in that because not everybody's blessed to live in a really cool city like I do, and they're all you know, in rural communities and all over and the, and all over the world in communities where they don't have access to the kind of things we have in a metropolitan area. And I love that there's more access. And what I'm seeing is people are 
so there was like this craze for online courses and they're cool, right? You can do them on your own time from your yoga pants, whatever, but there really is a desire for people to have human interaction with their teachers and mentors and coaches too. So, and for me, that's what I prefer, right? So I'm, I'm just aware that that's how I want to continue to be of service too, is to be actually live and in person on the phone with people or like a higher level of personal face-to-face -face or voice-to-voice -voice connectivity. Because I do think even that has been a pendulum. Like there was like, oh, there's so much liberation and freedom to be able to do things in my own time. So I'll just buy these courses or these books. And that's great. Some people learn that way. Awesome. But then there was also, it was like, well, oh my gosh, I'm not really doing it. I need somebody to help me along. And so it's like swinging back to, well, how can I have that face-to-face -face time? You know, even Khan Academy, like teaching through amazing resources like that access to the world. Incredible. But my husband, who's a teacher, you, you know, when, the way that those kids get to learn from somebody who's so passionate about that material, who knows personally about their lives, what's going on in their homes, like that's going to be a different kind of experience. Right. So mm -hmm. that just makes my heart like, Oh, I wish, you know, we could, I want us to keep coming back to that, but I know that it's scary because we're not really sure what, what's your way in. How do you start that conversation? for example, to help that older gentleman out, you know? And he, he did get through it. Uh, I think it was an airline personnel um, came and assisted. Somebody came and helped him out. Yeah, good. But still, I hear your point was valid. Well, I agree too with online courses because I know um, when I first encountered them, I was really excited by it because I was like, yeah. you know, at the time we were still doing the intensive early intervention for my kids, which meant my daughter had 40 hours a week of therapies on top of wow. trying to do schools and and. So there was a period of time where that was pretty much my full-time job was like with the two kids mm -hmm. getting all their stuff, doing all their things with, you know, one has had quite a few surgeries and things yeah. so where I was like, okay, I can, I can do this. And, um, but I can I do it on my own time. I can learn on my own time. Right. And then I would try to do like post 10 PM learning, which is really hard. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but then, um, I do remember a frustrating point in the four, first course I did like that, which was Marie Forleo's B-School was, I did that too. B-Schooler. Mm -hmm. But there was no way to reach her. There was absolutely no way mm -hmm. to contact oh. any feedback to be like, you know, I understand this, this point, but like, here's my struggle with it. There, you could get on those weekly calls, but even there, there were so many people, it was hard to ever be one who got there, you know, you raised your hand and actually got to be heard by this mm -hmm. person. Big expert. And I think that creating courses was a really big boon for the creators of the course in that ooh, passive income, like I make something once and I sell it a lot, which is kind of like books. But somehow to me, when I read a book, like when it's just, especially if I have an audio book and they're talking in my ear, it feels like a one-on-one -on -one interaction. I feel yeah. like this person wrote this and I am reading it in private. They're inside of my head. Unless I know the author's voice, I read it in my own head voice, which makes me feel like it's almost my thoughts. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah so much is and often you can I, I know a few people like Denise Duffield Thomas who um I read her books and then I did join her course yeah I love her too there's way more in the book way more detail than in the course but in the course you get other people you get interaction you, you get, get community you get yeah community, which I love that community but I did think it was funny like the two dollar book had way more information than the at the time I joined, you know, $700 course. Now it's much more expensive. Right. right? <laughs> so, so like just comparing my experience of the two, I was like, the community was worth paying for because I have met amazing people there and I've met some of them in person. Yeah. But this year, I like, I just went to San Diego and I came back from two live events where I met a number of people who I've only known online. And, and it was awesome. It was amazing. Yeah, I mean, I do feel totally. like it wasn't quite like seeing my siblings, but it was like seeing my favorite cousin who I hadn't seen in a couple of years or something because I was like, I know about you. I know about your business. I watch your videos, you know, like we've yes. interacted in all these ways. And it just felt amazing to hang out and to go eat a meal and just sit and have a regular conversation that wasn't like online interaction, you know? 1000%. And it, that happens almost everybody I've ever talked to. That's their experience, right? When they get to have that real human connection. I mean, again, so cool that you were able to initially come to know who they are via the online space. And so therefore there was an in, right? There was a, like something that brought you all together even at the events, but mm -hmm. it's so powerful when we can have like this human experience. And I really, really think people are longing for it. They're, 
they're longing for more debt. I know that they are. My clients tell me all the time, my group, are, you know, like they're longing to be themselves, to show up more real as who they really are mm -hmm. and to have other people see them for that mm -hmm. and to find a depth and intimacy from that place of authenticity. You know, it's, and it sounds so simple, but it gets so like tricky when you're in, in the process of, of doing it, you know, and sometimes it's not a fit. That's another thing. Sometimes people um, have to shed some layers of relationship too, in order to get the kinds of relationships they want. And actually Denise Duffield Thomas talks about that. Like that some people, you know, just you have to break up with certain people in your life and it might not feel good, but if you really want to surround yourself with a community that is, sees you for the exceptional human that you are, you can't break up with your mom. I mean, you know, look, I'm not, I don't, I haven't ever been a proponent of like just chopping off relationships ever, but I think there's ways to um, choose who you spend your time with that, you know, that those people really support you. Like I have such a strong, incredible, ridiculous support team crew. Like when I'm in my head and I'm, which came like when I was writing my book, like doubt, you know, like, oh my gosh, I'm about to like publish this thing and oh, you know. You can't, you can't, naked in the title. <laughs> it's naked in the title. It's my own eyes on the cover. I don't know if you, this is my eyes right here, right? Which I like totally wasn't going to do and was really encouraged to do because it was for me. Even that was like, you know, the eyes are the window to the soul, right? Oh yeah. Here, I'm pulling up the cover. I'm going to see if I can flash it to the YouTube audience. Um, Let's see. I'll have to go back from where I, I can do it. I have a paper version, but, um, paper version. okay. You should yeah. pull it so people can see it. Here we go. I have it there, but yeah. Oh, they're very, it's a very intense look. It's and good. it's like peeling back, you know, and it was a designer who obviously created that, but it was a vulnerable moment for me, you know? And, um, I've had many vulnerable moments and, uh, to get here and I had to call some people and just really just bring me back to myself and out of this, like, crazy chatter that we can get ourselves into that was like almost having me not push go on sharing this with the world. And you know, anybody who's written, I shouldn't say anybody who's written a book. I would say that many people who've written a book, like you're, you usually don't get rich off your book. I mean, some people have, and if it's your subsequential book, if you're obviously, if you wrote, um, if you're JK Rawlings, you know, there's exceptions as well, but even her, like when she started out, she was like a, a poor single mom who had some, a really creative genius mind. I don't think she had any idea it would go insane the way it went, you know, and with um, Harry Potter, it's, it's like, you really want to share something with people, you know, you're like, I, I have this thing and whether it's a book or, you know, a photograph or a painting or a poem, you know, and um, it's really about like getting that message out and sharing something that you love with other people. And that, feels scary. It's like telling somebody you love them for the first time, except that it's, they can actually tell you that they don't love you all over Amazon. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, that is true. Actually, it was funny. I was in, I got, I felt like I got baited into a um, Harry Potter debate by Christian anti Harry Potter people the other day online. And I, Interesting. I don't know why I decided to continue to engage, but I did mainly because, you know, like I did do comparative literature, like I've, I've read the Bible and I've read different religious texts. So I had some pretty good comparisons to make where you know, there were like the occult and witchcraft and stuff. And I was kind of like, okay, well, is it, is it a cult to, um, I don't know, put a curse on a whole nation of people to kill their firstborn sons or is it a curse to, you know? So I was like, I ha you know, I haven't at my disposal all of the, the stories, especially of the Exodus. I don't know why that one stuck more than anything else. Yeah. But, and I wasn't trying to say that your book is bad. I was trying to say your book is a book and it has lots of great stories. And this book is a book and has lots of great stories. And the Odyssey, oh my gosh, how many witches and like weirdo gods interfering with humans were there in the Iliad and the Odyssey? And, you know, if we're going to start banning books, they, where would it start? I don't know. Plus I hate book banning discussions. It makes me very, very angry. Right. But I really feel like what makes Harry Potter so successful for me anyways, I am a Harry Potter lover. Uh, my kids are too young to see all the movies, but we listened to the audio versions of the books read by Jim Dale, who won, what award was it? Maybe it was a Tony award. You know, it was some acting, like theater acting award for the fifth book. For the reading. Wow, cool. It was the most variation of character voices ever done in a single recording, for one thing, and he was just amazing at keeping them all yeah. But I feel like what, what connects with me in that is, is pain and loss 
and loyalty and over and over being picked up by your friends, like having friends who, no matter what, like they will walk over fire to help you. And those things, I mean, those are just such deep human elements. And even though it's fictional, like when, when you hear her interview, you know she's experienced some of these things. And I mean, who hasn't? We all have. And that's, I mean, I get angry when people try to say that the books weren't well written. And I'm like, did you actually read the books or did you just watch the movies where they cut out a lot of the backstory? You know? Right, of course. Yeah all of the friendship building of Harry and Ron and Hermione in the movies. They skip out the boring parts because I just want the action. But I'm like, those for me were the most important parts. It's the like- Yeah, yeah they're so rich, yeah. Yeah, that Harry and Ron connected and, you know, like, I don't know. And also, oh, the other one is a vulnerable, weak character being empowered. Like, because we've all felt vulnerable and weak, if nothing else, just as children, where we have no control. And mm-hmm. magical powers, oh my God, who doesn't wish to have magic? I mean- <laughs> come on right I mean I've spent time thinking about like what would mine be <laughs> yeah and I desires in all of us yeah. well and that's what that's why it was so successful because there is like I've had the opportunity to travel quite a bit in my lifetime like about I think about 20 countries and um there is so much that's the same about human beings and suffering and vulnerability and fear and loss and desire and love and lust and all of it. Like those are shared no matter where you're from, what your background, what your socioeconomic status is. Like there is a human truth about what it means to be a human being. Different people's desires may look different. Their losses are different. Their challenges are different. Their suffering is, has different roots, but the experience of desire and love and, you know, it's all a human experience. And um, that's when, like the power of books, when they can really draw on that so that millions of people feel connected, it's just, it's like mind blowing, you know, it's really, it's like tapping into something and truth telling in a really interesting way. And yeah, she had her own stuff that I think she wove all of that into what she wrote. I mean, I know I did. And my book is full of stories from my life. And um, I really believe that we, I, I have a strong belief in that we have more agency in our lives than we think we do. Um, meaning that we get to say, like we get to say more, you know, we don't all have the same opportunities. Life isn't fair. We aren't born on equal playing fields. I spent, you know, more than 10 years working in public schools, some in Philadelphia, all you have to do is step into a major urban center school and you'll see how different the opportunities are, you know, um, it's like heartbreaking, but we all have like the same common human experience of love and loss and suffering and a desire to be seen and understood. And, um, that's what I've seen, like in all the kinds of work I've done, all the kinds of travel and just in my own life, you know, my own, I come from, great opportunity and privilege. And I'm the first to say that. And I think it's my responsibility to own that and then use my, the opportunity I've been given, but I've had my own stuff. I mean, I, when I was 23, I was working in my dream job right out, you know, out of college. I'd gone to Kenya to, to teach in a school in a rural village in Kenya, which was like a dream come true. I came back, put on my black and Taylor suit, got on the train down to center city, Philadelphia for my job interview and landed this like dream job in all of these inner city schools under this big federal grant to help kids who historically don't go to college, go to college. It was awesome. And I was, I was like fired up. Right. And then, um, I was sitting at my desk one day and I had this piece sized lump above my collarbone. And what happened from there was that I was, I got a lymph node biopsy. It all happened so fast. It's almost wild to recount it now. Um, and I had cancer. And like, I was just doing my 23 year old thing. Oh my God. I was 23. Wow. Um, and it complete, like a bajillion lessons, right? Cancer sucks. Everybody on this, who's listening to this knows somebody in their life who's has had it. It's like, we, you can't avoid it. Um, I've known several, I lost my dad to cancer. Um, I've had my challenges. Right. But it's like, I, I can so see what I got out of that experience, how it gave me more courage, how it taught me again, that community is everything. Like the way people showed up for me, people freaking showed up for me. And I remember I turned 24 and I was a few chemos in 
hair was, I don't know if I lost my hair yet or not. And I'm at this, um, I don't think I had shaved my head yet. And I was at a birthday party. My parents threw me a birthday party at our, ho- our family home. And I was so uncomfortable because you know what? They were having a party for me because I had cancer. Like you don't usually just throw a 24 th- year old a birthday party at their parents' house, right? And like all sorts of people from my life were there. And I was like, oh gosh, this is, I love people. I love friends, but I felt like it was, it, it brought the reality of my mortality home because we were gathered. I knew why we were really there. Yeah. But my mom and all of her wisdom, like leaned in at one point and she said, Sage, just let the love in. People want to be here for you. They want to help you. It is generous of you to let them. And it was like, oh my God. I mean, it was a, let the love in huge, right? If we could all take just that away from this conversation, right? Yeah. Let people love you. B, that it's actually a generous act to allow people to contribute to you. You know, like I was like, which means that therefore I'm not selfish or weak or not independent, which is the things I was scared I would give up. Right. Mm -hmm. In fact, meant, wait, I could actually like just that it would be a kind and generous act to allow people to like bring me food and be at this party with me. And, you know, so but I didn't stay in that like scared space forever. You know, it was like, what can you take? And then what can you make it mean? Cause you could, I could have made it mean that, um, life is hard, bad things happen. It's unfair. Right. I could have decided all of that. Mm-hmm. And instead really it was what I mostly took was holy shit. Life is fleeting and I better freaking wake up and really enjoy it. Like really make it what I want it to be. And that's, what I more hung my hat on. Um, but that's like, that's in, in my book, I talk about that a lot. Like that's the interpretation. That's the stuff you get to decide, you know, cancer is cancer sucks, but then what, you know, what do you, you have two children with autism and look at you here, like out in the world, having this conversation, making a difference, you know, speak, you know, supporting them and speaking up. And I mean, you don't have, you could just be at home, like, Oh, gosh, this is so hard and it's so unfair. And I'm sure you have your moments. Yeah. And I'm sure you had plenty. To, I, I, when we got the diagnosis for my oldest, I cried for two days. Yeah, of and course. Then, I cried a lot. And then I was like, we are going to get her the best freaking treatment we can find. We're going to take yeah. her to the best places. Yeah. But yeah, you know, and the, the point about like allowing people to help you, because that was something I struggled with a lot. Earlier. Yeah, totally. Was, like nobody does anything except me. Mm-hmm. my kids you know, I got very territorial yeah and protective and fierce yeah and um a few years in I realized that especially when it's something that is lifelong um which I'm yeah the cancer was not lifelong or life ending but also like think about with your father you said you lost your father um mm-hmm. you having the chance to do things for your father and give to him in his time of need helped you as a person you know helped you fulfill and deal with your grief and deal with all that stuff moving on and um while me doing things for my kids I needed to when I finally you know after my my kids both have sleep disorders so there was I had about eight years of infant sleep you know three Mm. hours time two three hours especially when the second one was an infant and the other one had the sleep disorder there came a point where I just couldn't I couldn't function and I yeah I needed help. I was like, I don't even know how many brain cells I've lost from lack of sleep for eight years. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, I can't yeah, even I imagine. Know. Oh my gosh, that sounds yeah. like hell. For yeah. women who, who have, you know, before birth control, when women would have one baby after another, and you might be pregnant or nursing for nine years, that was kind mm-hmm. of how I, I was like, oh my gosh, like not only would going back to a career not really be that important or feasible if you've been pregnant and nursing for nine years like your body has been so depleted and yeah right I I think people really underestimate what just plain old regular pregnancy and birth take out of you um I personally feel like not only should we not be punished for having babies by losing our careers and losing pay off I think we should be paid for pain suffering and (laughs) like every time a woman gets pregnant you are risking death people die every day in childbirth still even in the developed world like it happens all the time so yeah I think if we value children this is totally a separate 
feminist moment. Yeah. But like, I think we should actually get paid for having our babies because it's really freaking hard. But yeah. aside from that, like accepting the help when I finally was like, mom, I need help. <laughs> like, yes, please help, help me. I need, I need someone to come help me. Sometimes we even miss the moment when it would have been most helpful and most useful because you're not ready to ask for it yet. So I think- um, Yeah, and that's because we make it mean something. We make everything freaking mean something. So we make asking for help mean that we can't handle it, that we're weak, we're not capable, we're inadequate, um, you know, whatever it is for me, like that I'm not independent, that I'm not strong. And that's just bullshit. It's just bullshit, but it's, it seems so real when you're in it. Like until you can peel back what I call fact versus fiction, like when, until you can separate the two, like, you know, what the facts are and what the fiction is that you've laid on top of it, you, you cannot have full responsibility for your, for your life until you can see that, right? So the facts are your kids weren't sleeping. And what you made it mean was I should be able to handle it. I should be able to, you know, take care of my children. Why would I have children if I couldn't take care of them? Isn't this what all moms go through? I mean, having kids is just hard. I should be able to figure this out. I'm really smart. I'm, you know, I've, I've read a bunch of this and this and that, right? It's instead of just like, my children are sleeping. Agree. Come on. <laughs> you know? People have degrees, have babies all the time. <laughs> exactly. It's a million, right? I mean, like, and people would say, first of all, this is a total tangent. We don't have to go down this path, but the amount of judging that happens the second you get pregnant all the way through being a mom is crazy pants to me. Yeah. And it's so anti the women's movement because the women's movement is about choice. Mm -hmm. and women having choice and freedom to speak. Mm -hmm. And that's like a big passion of mine. I'm coaching primarily women to have a voice. And as soon as we tell them, well, you must have a vaginal birth and you must not have an epidural. And if you have a C-section, you, you know, you're the weaker version of your gender. And if you do attachment mm -hmm. parenting, yes. uh, mm -hmm. you know, you have to strap that baby on. How dare you not breastfeed or Oh, you're doing attachment parenting? Well, your children won't be independent at all. They won't be, you know, you need to make sure that they can separate. Like, I was like, holy cow, people. Like, last I checked, this was my body, my baby, and my choices, you know? And um, just more compassion for each other. Like, let's just be more compassionate around that it's, a, it's really a personal journey. You and if you have a partner together, you know? Um, so I do feel like part of that, and then we, um, that is the conditioning back to the, to the book of naked communication in our work. Like the conditioning is such that you can't tease out your own voice in the, in the storm, you know, like, and I had to do a very, a lot of my process to being a mom was unconventional. I couldn't get pregnant naturally. I couldn't have my babies naturally. You know, there was like several times where I was like, well, you know, I got to, surrender you know what i mean and make choices based on what i'm what i what's presenting itself to me but until we can tease out like what is the actual fact versus every bit of junk we've put on top of it you know it's really complicated and those are like all the layers of clothing on our communication too right. exactly so, so right back to getting naked yeah <laughs> it always comes back to me uh, I, I always like to have a few actionable takeaways that our, our audience can, um, can act on, see how effective they are, and then be like, I need more, I'm gonna go buy your book. What can you give, awesome. <laughs> what can you give the audience to be like, here are ways that you can start working on communicating in, in this way immediately. Totally. Oh my gosh, there's so many. Okay, but you have to start <laughs> with the one. Um, you have to start with looking at yourself. Like everybody says that, and I know it sounds, but it's really the truth. If you don't know how you, communicate already, it's really hard to change, shift, or evolve how you currently communicate. You really have to know, like, are you more passive? Are you more assertive? Are you more direct? Are you more, um, <laughs> what's that? Passive aggressive. <laughs> passive aggressive, right? Like you got to start looking just, you can look at that by just, um, noticing when you bite, when you hold your tongue, like when you bite your tongue, you know, or when you feel like you want to say something, but for some reason you're not, or you can notice by how people respond to you when you do speak up, do, you know, are they listening? Are they um, disengaging as soon as you're the one to raise your hand? Like just start noticing how you occur in the world. And that's like the pathway in to being able to change every relationship in your life. Mm. So ultimately it's only you who can, you can only really change yourself. But if you do, 
other people respond to you differently. 100% people respond to you differently, right? You all know those people who walk into a board meeting or into a party, right? Mm -hmm. And people are like gravitating towards them as soon as they start to talk or the ones who are kind of invisible and there's no, this isn't about being an extrovert, being an introvert, right or wrong. It's just about knowing how you show up. I have to be responsible for the fact that I've always been loud, fast talking, fast thinking, pretty assertive, direct, honest. I just need to be responsible for that because my almost eight-year-old, my son turns eight on Saturday, um, he can't handle that sometimes. He really, he's sensitive. And the way that I naturally show up doesn't always land. And I want him to feel safe with me, to feel heard by me, to feel like I listen to him. So I have to know where I am in all of this, right? So that's number one. Um, number two is sometimes people think naked communication is just about saying more of what you think and feel and being real, right? But there's, it's nuanced. You, you want to know, you want to begin to notice when to speak up and when not to and have choice about it, right? So it's not always the time. If something is still really raw and really, or really angry or really tender, it might be that you're not ready to have the conversation that needs to be had until you can actually show up responsibly to that conversation. So um, it's not just about spouting off more of your truth. It's about being reflective and having choice. So you can be responsive and not just reactive. And the third thing I'll say is, um, oh, there was a third one I wanted to say. Now I forget. See, there's so many. Um, okay, the one I'll leave you with is about conflict. Everybody has conflicts and everybody always wants to know what to do about it. This is much bigger conversation and you, you know, there is more in the book about that, but you always want to take responsibility for your part. And that doesn't mean that you let the other person off the hook. Only apologize for what you really should apologize for. Women apologize way too much. That's a hard one. Yeah, as you right? said, I was like, oh. Oh my gosh. Grandma. My grandma would apologize for like the world. Yeah, like for the weather. Like, oh, I'm so sorry. It's a rainy day. It's not your fault. It's a rainy day. Oh, excuse me for a Somebody just told me on another podcast interview, they were like, I just had a woman apologize because she had to go to the bathroom. Oh, I'm so sorry. I have to go to the bathroom. I know we just sat down for lunch and it was like, you have to go to the bathroom. Like, that's not, your, that's just a the human thing. Function. Right. Can I tell you one of my lifelong frustrations with communication? Yes, please. Yes. I'm probably a lot more like your son. Um, I love one-on-one -on -one conversation. You know, that's part of why I love podcasting is you and I can have this private conversation as if it's just you and me, but the information is so great. And then we can put it out to the world. Yeah, it's awesome. But um, particularly with my relationships, my boyfriends and parents, particularly male parents, I have always had this issue of when we start having a conflict and I really want to express myself and I want to be strong and I want to not just give in and be a doormat and get walked over. Yeah. I have this thing that happens in my throat though, where it feels like it's this big lump. And I'm going to admit right here, I'm a crier. Like I cry at commercials. I, mm -hmm. I've had a few years off of it because I was on antidepressants. I'm, I've just weaned myself off of it. And one of the first things I noticed was like, Oh my God, I just teared up at that commercial. <laughs> like, yeah. You're right, right, right. I guess I'm feeling the depth and breadth of my own emotions again. Um, and, I, and it was, you know, I was on it mainly because of the sleep issues that I was having. Like, yeah. Yeah. It, it was kind of a circumstantial thing that we're now hopefully growing out of, and I would like to exist without, without antidepressants. But um, I also want to talk about it openly because I think that's another thing we don't talk about is all of the uh, mental health. Um, stigma. Um, so when I'm talking and having an argument and I start to get emotional, it feels like I get a rock in my throat and I'm like, just think, talking about it right now, I can feel it there right now. Yeah. Right. And you start to tear up and I feel like if I cry, I lose. Like that's always been such a frustration for me because once I start getting emotional and cry, I can't talk anymore. Like it feels like I just, ugh. and I have to go away. And I feel like I couldn't get my point in at the moment when it was it was, would have been most effective. You know, I have to like retreat and go away and gather, think about it, reflect and try to come back at the conversation. Depending on who it's with, it doesn't always work. Sometimes I feel like I do not get heard because I have this like physical, emotional reaction to yeah. conflict. And, you know, obviously with um, divorces and feeling like, you know, I, I've definitely had abandonment feelings. And then one of my mother's, uh, her second husband was very abusive. So like, I definitely have issues with men. I'm aware of them. I've worked through it a lot, but I still have this thing. Even with my husband, I've had to talk to him about it. I'm like, okay, if we get to this point and I get too emotional, we have to go 
take five. <laughs> Go to our but that's a really powerful way of handling it, Jen. That's like perfect. No, because we, so there's so much there. I mean, like we could do a whole freaking coaching session on that because it's so juicy, but <laughs> let me try and for the, for the listeners or the watchers, like get it down. So first of all, there were so many stories in what you were saying. Like you have a lot of meaning you're placing on all of it. Like if you cry, you've lost. What? That's a big story, but right? I, I lose the ability. Right, but, so, but then you have the story of if I don't <laughs> get my point in right then, I'm not powerful. Yeah. And I'm not effective. Yeah, it feels that way. It feels that way, right? But it's not, but that's, that's not true. Yeah. That's just the sensation. And in fact, sometimes in the moment, point making isn't as effective as we think it is, right? More that's about like being right, making the other person wrong. No, I'm not saying it is always, but that's often it, right? When we have this like, oh, I have the perfect thing to say back right now. You know what I mean? It's really, it's often about like positioning ourselves, me versus them. Or and you want to- I get the perfect thing 10 minutes later. Exactly. And that sometimes is, is but that's sometimes great. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, I've had to work this through with my own husband because I came in a family where you were like, in your face, get it out, get it over with. And he came with, sweep it under the rug, don't ever talk about it. And we were like, what, what is, you know, it was like, like this, right? Like trying to figure out how do we talk through arguments or challenges or conflicts? Because I, the more he would do pull back, the more bulldog I got. That's, it was ugly. Like mm -hmm. if he did, wasn't ready to talk, I'm pissed. I'm like, well, why won't you talk to me about this? You know, <laughs> married 10 years this year. So we worked through some you did that. I was like, oh my God, my, yeah, I came, my mom's family was a uh, never yell, never, like shouting yeah. and crying meant divorce or death. Like, right. And in my family, shouting and crying meant like Saturday afternoon. And yeah. like, so Saturday dinner could be really fun and awesome again. <laughs> like literally that was like, what? You're pissed. Great. Okay, cool. I love you. Let's go. You know, like, and he was just like, that means scary and bad. And you know, we have real problems. And I'm like, no, it doesn't. It just means I need you to close the damn cabinets. And I just want you to please close the cabinets. You know, I'm giving that example, but like, so I just want to give you permission that this is your throat and you have a big feeling heart <laughs> and a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. And I do too. And that you can do conflict in your own time frame and in your own way without it meaning that you suck at conflict. If you have already said to your husband, hey, when I'm really feeling it, I just need a minute and then I wanna come back to it, like, that's awesome. And that's where we've come to a lot of times. Like, he, need, I, he does not process it as fast as I do. He just, in anything, he's brilliant. It's not about like a processing, it's just a problem. It's just that that's yeah. how he is, whereas- Quick wit, that's, I've always felt like, I'm smart, but I'm not the quick wit. I can't get the zinger back yes. in there. So well, I, here's the other perspective of, a, of another interpretation for you. I am the quick wit. Yeah, you seem like a quick wit. I probably could have been a lawyer. I don't know why. I could have been a litigator, right? Glad I'm not. But it has been, at times served me brilliantly, and at times been absolutely to my detriment. Because yeah. you know what quick-witted people can be? Mean. Mean as hell. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I felt on the other side of that a lot. Of being like... Yeah. And so it's great that you asked that because it goes full circle back to, I have to be responsible for the way that I communicate. Mm -hmm. Right. Remember I said the first step in all of this is awareness. If you want to be more naked, you have to get more real with yourself. I'm aware that if I'm feeling threatened or hurt, if I'm not careful, I am so quick. I will just zing right into the weakest point. I mean, that's horrible to admit. I mean, and I'm almost 40. And so I've grown up and I have way more control over that. But if I work with my clients, some who don't, and then they feel like shit because they make their children and their partners and their colleagues feel bad. And it's coming from their own feeling threatened. Right. So I want you to, I want to say that there isn't a right or wrong way to do it. It's just knowing how you do it. So you can have choice around how you want to express yourself in, in a way that's most effective choice in a way that's most effective. Right. So, you know, you've got the throat thing. You've got the throat thing. I would swallow. I would take some deep breaths, deep breaths by you some time. Yeah. When you're really upset, just breathing by some time. I do that with my kids all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
high anxiety level. So we, we do, we do actually we do that. And then we do this sata nama, like this presence uh -huh. thing, you know, cause I'm like, if, especially my oldest, if I can get her to focus or count or do something to distract her mind from it, it helps a lot. So Huge. Myself too. So try it for yourself. Yeah. But more than anything also, don't make yourself wrong about being who you are. Yeah. Like that's how, that's what happens for you when you get upset and you can work with that. See, you're right. There'll be I love that podcast is I get free coaching by having Yeah, genius. I know. And I love it because it's my favorite thing to do. <laughs> so we should probably wrap up because I'm just gonna admit this to my um my listeners. I don't always I always tell the guests this, but often I notice after about a half hour we have a big drop off in, in listenership on the podcast. So I try to keep them shorter, knowing that not everyone makes it to the end. But I want to make sure we've mentioned your book. So people can get that on Amazon, right? We'll put yep. Mm -hmm. yep. And you can also check it out. On, Amazon's the greatest place to get it, but you can read more about all everything on my website, which is Sage okay. B Hobbs. B is in badass, I guess. You have to have the B to get to the right spot. Okay. We'll put a link in the show notes and everything. And um, also to your website for people who want to have more access to you and possibly get coached. Do you, are you, do you take one-on-one -on -one clients right now or groups? Um, I do both one-on-one -on -one and group depends on what people are looking for. And there's some great free things on the website too, that give you a better taste of what, what I'm up to. But yes, I do both group and one-on-one -on -one coaching. Okay. And I noticed, um, that you also have a free cheat sheet for people on how to ask for what they want. Yes. Which is good. So we'll put a link to that as well because, great. um, I think that's hard. I mean, in, in all of these things we were talking about with uh, the way we put all of these layers on top of our communication so it's not naked and the way we struggle to have those most important conversations, it is very hard to ask for what it's so hard. we want. But even once you know... Well, that's in there too. There's a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and, and like when you don't, what the cost is when you don't, I think that's also, you know, it's a really a huge cost to years and years of not ask, not speaking up and making requests. So yeah, that's an easy thing to, that's a, just get that thing. Cause everybody needs that thing. <laughs> Thank you. I haven't gotten it myself, but just to throw one more book in here since we're talking about lots of Yeah, books. please. Have you read, um, the art of asking by, um, no, Amanda Palmer. I have never read it. Is it good? Um, it is, it is. I really liked it a lot. So I knew Amanda Palmer back in my Bryn Mawr college days. She was oh, in nice. the Dresden dolls, which I really liked. It was, it was kind of like whacked out vaudeville music like she's a pianist um, cool. she, but she's married to neil gaiman who i've been reading oh yeah but so you've been loving that that guy's work right yeah which i had always shied away from him because of the like um fiction like fantasy sci-fi horror genre stuff that he was in once i started reading his book i was like these are amazing stories and he's they're really well written i i, I don't know i sometimes i have to write I, down neil gaiman Neil Gaiman. Yeah. Right now, let's see, I'm reading the a, a Nancy boys, and, but I really, I read the ocean at the end of the lane. That was, mm -hmm. that was, I'd say start there. That felt just as psychological as fantasy. I mean, obviously there's, he works these sort of fantastical otherworldly things into it, but I was like, I could very just as easily read this as a psychological kind of thriller in that all of this is happening in the person's mind. Maybe it's all happening in the real world, but it could also just right. be in the mind. So. Um, yeah, so the fact that she was married to him is why I finally like jumped that genre um, barrier and, and read him because I'm doing that more and more. Like I really like YA fiction, but going through college, the books I read, I was very much on a like, I read serious literature and I love serious literature. And then I read nonfiction. Like I read a lot of nonfiction too, because yeah. I read more things. But I'm finally like, oh, I'm, I really don't like these boundaries and different, like for music, I really hate the genre boundaries for music and I listen across them. So yeah, yeah. Across them too. So yeah. That's, love that's, it. I haven't read it, but I really feel like people should be more playful with what they read, listen to and do in their lives. Yeah. yeah we can end with that, but like play fun, creative. For a book to read right now, go ahead and get Naked Communication because no matter how good we think we are at communicating, I think we can all, that's something that's ongoing through our lives and we can always improve. 100%. Thank you, Jen. Thank you for being here. It's been great to talk to you. You too. So fun. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.